Well, good morning. Our second scripture reading today is going to be in John 3, 16 through 17. Very familiar passage we're talking about all this Christmas season. And John writes, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Pray with me. God, as we open up your word today and as we reflect on your incredible love, may we take hope and courage in it. God, so much is discouraging around us right now, but we know that you are above it all. Help us hold on to that hope. Help us be your church to bring light and love to the world that so desperately needs to sense your peace in this time. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Pastor Mark uh, has given me free reign since there's no Browns game after today's sermon that I can go as long as I want. So I'm just joking. He never said that. That's a total lie. I confess my sin to you. So, (laughs) so many of you may not know that way before 2020 had a pandemic, 2020 was ironically named the year of the nurse. Did you know that? I'm certain those who work in nursing as well as in healthcare never knew this year was going to carry with it all the challenges and sacrifices that would be required. So I saw an interesting story on CBS this week where this millionaire slash billionaire wanted to bless those who helped us through the pandemic. So he sent out an envelope to three individuals with instructions not to open what they had received until they had heard instructions from a CBS spokesperson. So these individuals were told that a news crew would be coming to their home to interview them uh, about how they had helped during the pandemic. What they didn't know was that was all a ruse. It was all a front to something else. So they brought the millionaire billionaire into a dark room on camera so that he couldn't be identified. And he then, one by one, asked each of them to open up their envelopes. To their shock and surprise, each person found 10 $100 bills together as a gift to them, to just give some appreciation for the sacrifices that they have made this year. Of course, they all broke down in tears. And this anonymous donor not only did it for these three individuals, but picked 97 other people who would also get the blessing of $1,000 to help them through this year. It was an act of sacrificial love for those who have been giving sacrificially. Now you also may have heard this week Time Magazine released their person of the year as President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris. And let me say in advance, I'm not taking a political position when I say this, but I think they got it wrong. No disrespect to our politicians, But the true heroes of this year have to be the essential workers. For sacrificing every day. And I know I may be a little biased because I work in the hospital, but I think the heroes who have got us through this year are the cleaning staff, the respiratory therapists, the nurse aides, the nurses, the doctors, the researchers, those who deliver packages, those who work on the front line to provide food in the service industry, those are our heroes this year. They had no idea when they had their jobs that they were going to step into something that was going to require so much. So as we are in the season of Advent, the season focused on the coming of Jesus to earth, and also Advent meaning to come, to focus on Jesus' eventual return, we've been specifically looking at this passage of John 3, 16 and 17. 
to see who Jesus is to us during this time. Now last week, Pastor Mark beautifully spoke to us about for God so loved the world and God's unconditional love for us. This week, I'm going to look at the next part of the verse, which says that he gave his one and only son. We're going to look at what sacrificial and self-denying love look like. We're also going to look at Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8 that we read earlier, which helps us see what that love specifically was fleshed out in Jesus' life as he was here. So let's examine four aspects today of Jesus' sacrificial love. Number one, Jesus' sacrificial love was totally his choice. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. Now, as Pastor Marcus pointed out, one of the difficulties for us as humans is completely wrapping our brains around the theological concept of the Trinity. Right? It's a little bit beyond us. How can God be three and yet one? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And then the even more difficult part of understanding the complexity of this relationship is understanding how can God give up part of himself to become a human and still retain the oneness of God? Does that hurt your brain? It hurts mine a little bit. And yet that is exactly what happened. There is only one time in history that God the Father was separated from the Son, and that was the moment on the cross when Jesus became sin for us. Now I'm sure Pastor Joe will be unpacking that more in his sermon next week, so I'm not going to steal his thunder or he will tell me about it later. (laughs) Now, it would be impossible to preach this passage without alluding to the relationship of the Old Testament story of Abraham and Isaac. It's the one story that just comes up naturally when you hear this passage about giving your only son. So let me look at that real quickly for us. Back in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1. It says, some time later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Of course, we know the rest of the story. Abraham goes up to the mountain and prepares to kill his own son, But God tells him to stop just as Abraham raises the knife. And then God provides a ram caught in the thicket for the sacrifice instead. This, of course, is a foreshadowing of what God will do through Jesus, shown clearly by the thorns around the ram's head, symbolizing the crown of thorns Jesus would wear someday. Thanks to my wife, by the way, about pointing that out and that observation, because I hadn't seen that before. But there are distinctions about this sacrifice with Abraham and Isaac and between God the Father and God the Son. When Abraham went to offer Isaac on the altar, Isaac did not go willingly knowing what was ahead, did he? We don't hear any objections from Isaac besides asking where the sacrifice was going to come from. I'm sure he trusted his father. But I'm sure as he was bound on the altar and that knife was being raised, he probably was thinking about how he should have stayed home that day. (laughs) If Isaac was told what was going to happen and wasn't kept in the dark, he would have never gone. So here's the first point I see about self-sacrifice in this passage. Jesus sacrifices to lay down his own life on our behalf, not reluctantly, but willingly. 
As a matter of fact, throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus says on multiple occasions about how he has the choice in his own death. But none more clearly, I think, than in John's chapter 10. John chapter 10, which says this, starting in verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand. He cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. Do you see see this clear theme here? Jesus' sacrificial love was totally his choice. He wasn't being strong-armed by God the Father to do this. And how could he do it? See, as Jesus was one with God the Father, Jesus totally could submit to that relationship. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, as Jesus struggles with his humanity, knowing the pain he would endure for us, He willingly submits by saying, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Now I think the parent relationship is evident as a parallel to the son submitting to the father. For those of you who have children, you probably know that your kids don't always do the difficult tasks you ask of them, right? (laughs) Sometimes we have to guilt them. Sometimes we have to punish them if they don't do it. But Jesus was not compelled out of guilt. I'm so grateful. He was compelled out of his enormous love for us. My Gospel of John professor from seminary, Gerald Borchard, wrote, The full perspective of self-sacrifice is that God is the initiator and principal actor in salvation, and we should never think that salvation originated with us. Wasn't our idea. You know, there are several people throughout the scriptures who gave up their children for God's purposes, right? Abraham with Isaac, Jochebed with Moses, Elkanah and Hannah with Samuel. What's interesting though, and as I reflected on the scriptures, is all of those individuals ended up having other children. Even Mary and Joseph had our other children. But God gave us his only son. That's how much we meant to him. The second thing I see of sacrificial love is that Jesus' sacrificial love was more than just dying. It was more than just dying. Philippians 2, as was read, Let me read again. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself to become obedient to death, even death on a cross." 
Now certainly, Jesus' death was the ultimate display of love for humanity. But we cannot forget that his life was also a sacrifice. He gave up the glories of heaven to wrap himself in human flesh. He put aside his divinity to be part of humanity and experience what it was like to be human. Unfortunately, our manger scenes outside our homes, we've cutesified the manger scene, haven't we? We've made it something cute and adorable. That was never the intention of the first Christmas. It was supposed to be awe-inspiring and humbling to acknowledge that God would come this way. The God of the universe, born in humble circumstances, just to be with us. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but Jesus had to go through puberty. He experienced zits. His voice changed. All the parts of growing up as a young male child. And maybe you've never thought about this, but Jesus even experienced the deaths of his earthly father, Joseph, and his best friend and cousin, John the Baptist. And as Philippians says, he did not consider equality with God to be used to his own advantage. Jesus had the power to raise the dead, but chose not to in those instances in losing Joseph and John the Baptist. Why? Why not? Why not use that power? I believe he did so in order that you and I can have a savior who we can relate to, who knew what it was like to go through grief and experience the death of a parent and the death of a best friend. One of my friends from back home this year lost her mother and then unexpectedly, several months later, lost her best friend. She has understandably been wrestling with these things that have happened and holds the weight of those losses daily in her grief. This has even been a hard year for many in our nation as over 300,000 people have lost their lives to COVID-19 as well. Grief is a heavy thing to carry, especially this year. But my friend, you who lost her mom and best friend, I also know that she takes comfort in her faith and that Jesus is going to help her through each day. And you know what gives her comfort is knowing that we have a Savior who experienced those things. He carried them. He didn't bypass them when things got hard. He knows what it's like to have those kind of losses. We don't have a God who is far off. And doesn't understand us. We have a God who knows intimately the hurts and griefs we carry. And he even experienced the same temptations we face. Let me just read a few scripture passages that I find helpful to remind me of how Jesus lived out his life for us. Hebrews 4.15 states, For we do not have a high priest who was unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Hebrews 2.18 says, Because he himself suffered, and when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And 1 Corinthians 10.13, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. You see, Jesus experienced the human experience fully. That when we are struggling, we have someone to look to 
who can guide us on the right path forward. Even when we are tempted the most to self-destruct, Jesus knows the way to guide us back. You know, if Jesus had died at two years old at the hand of Herod's decree, it would not have been the same as when he died on the cross. Because Jesus willingly took those steps up to Calvary. If he died as a baby, he would not have had a choice in the matter. But he knew when he was born that he was born to die so that you and I could enter into that personal relationship with God. Which brings me to my third point of sacrificial love, and that is that Jesus' sacrificial love magnifies our need for him. It magnifies our need for him. Self-sacrifice has another component to it, and that is self-denial. The two kind of go hand in hand. If you think about it, all sin comes from our inability to deny something our earthly body wants. Right? When we lash out in anger, we refuse to have self-control. When we overeat, we refuse to be satisfied with just enough. When we get drunk, We refuse to be comforted by God in our pain. When we commit adultery, we refuse to be devoted to one person. When we murder, we refuse to allow God to bring justice. When we covet other people's stuff or steal, we refuse to be happy with what we have. And when we turn to other things to bring us peace and joy, we refuse to allow Jesus to be our Lord and our Savior of our lives. Now, as I prepared this sermon, I too struggled as Pastor Mark did with preparing his last sermon because I know how deeply I fall short of acknowledging Jesus' sacrificial love for me and how I live daily. And I started having feelings of unworthiness of bringing God's word and message to you today. Because I know I'm a sinful man. I don't always live these things out daily. And then Jesus reminded me, hey Brent, go preach my word. I'll work through your inadequacies. Thank God for that. (laughs) Romans 7 is a passage that just came to mind as I was reflecting about how we need Jesus' sacrificial love and why that's magnified. Because this is our struggle right here. Romans 7, starting in verse 14, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. That is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do not do what I want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Let me just tell you, that is like everybody struggle with any sort of addiction, right? This week I had a patient who had struggled with a three-year addiction to alcohol. As we talked, I discovered her addiction started when her husband separated from her. She did not know how to cope with the hurt 
and the loss of a 30-year relationship. So she tried to numb the pain with drinking. She tried getting sober. She joined AA. She was working the 12-step program. She was even able to be sober for four months. But when she was reminded of her pain, she returned to alcohol again. And this last time that brought her into the clinic, she got drunk by drinking 19 bottles of wine in three days and attempted to overdose on Tylenol. And before I visited her, I make a lot of assumptions before I go in the room. Um, Because that's my work as a chaplain. I'm trying to prep, what am I going to prepare for? What's this person going to be like? And I thought she'd be the kind of person who would blame everybody else. But she didn't. And as I visited her, I discovered she was living out Romans 7. She was stuck. And she was a believer. She knew the Lord. She was deeply sorry for her choices. And at the same time, she just had no ability to break free. She was hoping getting into a long-term treatment facility would help this time. That was, that was her next hope, that somehow she was bad enough this time they, they would admit her. But I think what struck me during the visit was that was when she cried. Because after I prayed for her, I looked her in the eyes and I said, you know, God still loves you deeply. And the tears just welled up. And she said, you have no idea how I needed to hear that. See, we need not to be reminded of God's punishment to motivate life change. But we need to be reminded of God's love for us. Guilt motivates for a time, but love motivates for a lifetime. When we truly, truly get this, it can change our entire perspective on how to live, how to face those challenges, how to break free from those addictions. When we truly understand how much God loved us by sending his only son It should compel us to change. Not because we're guilted out of it, but the sheer appreciation of what we've been given. Had Jesus not come, our condemnation would be all we have. Which leads me to my final point. And that is that Jesus' sacrificial love models a love we should be giving. Jesus' sacrificial love models a love we should be giving. You know, as we go through this Christmas season and we're buying our obligatory gifts for our list, let's do a little bit of a heart check. Why are we doing it? Is it to just get a task off our list? That's usually mine. Is it to avoid people being disappointed in us? Is it to make people think better of us? Or is it to make others love us more? Or is it simply because you're a shopaholic and you have problems? (laughs) Now, don't get me wrong, I think we need to model generosity. And uh, Christmas is a time 
when we can see those around us who have greater needs than our own capitalistic desires. And sometimes it's just great to give gifts to our kids because we love them so much. I think that's how God is. So, I didn't realize I was going to get choked up so much today. Um, I know I've shared this before, how I went through a divorce. What I haven't shared is that the divorce finalized right before Christmas, eight years ago. And things were tough financially. Um, I had to buy clothes for my girls from thrift stores, go to food banks to feed them. It was a tough time. So when Christmas was getting close, I was kind of panicking about making it special for my girls. So I decided to take them shopping at the mall. Uh, It's the worst thing, because you just see everything you can't afford, right? And that year, one of the new game systems was coming out, the Wii U. I don't know if anybody remembered that at all back in 2012. And I so wanted to just get that for my girls. I was willing to put it on a credit card, even though my credit cards were already maxed. I just was wanting to do something to make their Christmas special. And my oldest daughter, Hannah, she surprised me. She was 10 at the time. And I was talking through the girls about buying the system for them for Christmas. And I think, in a sense, they probably sensed my panic (laughs) and how I was overextended financially. And I remember Hannah saying to me, Daddy, it's okay. You don't have to get that for us. Why don't we take that money and give to provide a water filtration system to a family overseas instead? Needless to say, I started to cry, as I am now, (laughs) recounting the story. It's that innocent, sweet love of a child. That's the kind of pure love that God has in sending his son for us. So as we go through this, this Christmas season, may we be reminded to be self-sacrificing for others. Let us think about the needs of the many over our own needs and desires. Let us be less concerned about our personal rights and more concerned about serving the greater good. I want to conclude uh, with a lyrics from a country song that came out a few years ago, and it's really tugged on my heart in the last few weeks. But I thought about how I want my heart to reflect the thoughts of this song this Christmas season. It's a song called The Man I Want to Be by Chris Young. Here's what it says. God, I'm down here on my knees because it's the last place left to fall, begging for another chance if there's any chance at all, that you might be listening, still be listening, loving and forgiving guys like me. I've spent my whole life getting it all wrong, and I sure could use your help, because from now on, I want to be a good man, a do-like-I-should man. I want to be the kind of man the mirror likes to see. I want to be a strong man and admit that I was wrong, man. God, I'm asking you to come change me into the man I want to be. May God change us and our hearts this season when we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, May it not become an overused verse, but one that compels us to love God deeper and give us the ability to love others like God does. 
Let us pray. God, we're thankful for your love for us. Words cannot express it. Our actions cannot express our gratefulness. You have been so generous, so self-sacrificing, and you didn't have to do it, God. You could have left us to our own vices, and you would have been completely just in doing so. But God, you aren't just a just God, you are a loving God. And we're so grateful that Jesus would come and take the penalty that we so much deserved so that we could have fellowship with you, so that we could find peace and joy in this season, even in this pandemic. God, help us to be changed out of your love and help us to show your love through this season. And we pray this in Jesus' name.